All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Kativ Autodesk Virtual Academy. I'm Nigel Mbaik, as has been for the last couple of weeks here. Um, name still won't change. Um, today, I'm joined with a special guest here, Jeff Brown from Autodesk. Um, he happens to be on the Fusion team, technical specialist, kind of knows everything about those cloud-based manufacturing tools. Good morning, Jeff. How are you doing? Yeah, hey, everybody. Great to be here. And, uh, you know, I also have a hidden guest here, uh, Richard Sanchez, who's done a couple of these AVAs for us before. Um, he happens to be uh, working on site today. So, uh, Rich, uh, hi, how's it going? Hey, guys, how you doing? I don't have my webcam today, but I'm definitely here to uh, listen in and answer any questions. Definitely. So, um, there's a couple of reasons we picked Fusion uh, as today's topic. One, um, it was pretty... Uh, widely requested by some of the, the viewers here, and we do take that into account. If you do request a particular topic, we'll go ahead and try our best to make that a reality in the next couple of weeks. Um, second of all, um, you know, the Fusion team has worked uh, pretty extensively releasing like really cool things, such as last year, um, around this time they did simulation. Um, and it's really awesome. Me and Rich have used the tool um, on like a more hobby basis um, in regards to making super cool stuff. So um, if you guys are more interested in that, uh, definitely Jeff will go over some of that with you today. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and uh, give it to Jeff. But uh, if you do have any questions during this webinar, go ahead and type them into the questions panel, and uh, we'll be able to make sure we answer those either during the session or our dedicated Q&A at the end. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Jeff, you've got the floor. Thanks a lot, Nigel. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Can you just give me a verification that uh, you can see that all right? Good to go. Okay, perfect. So, um, yeah, thanks, Nigel and Rich, for, for bringing me on this. I'm really excited to, to be able to present here. So I'm Jeff Brown. I'm a manufacturing technical specialist for Autodesk's cloud manufacturing products. Um, I've been with Autodesk about a little over two years. Before that, I was with SOLIDWORKS for three years, and then before that, seven years in the uh, aerospace engineering industry. So, uh, you know, over a dec decade of both real engineering, real world engineering, and then also, you know, software uh, applications and things like that. So I'm really excited to be on the Fusion team. It's a really cool, forward looking product. And um, I'm going to share a little bit about what it is, why we made it, and then do a little bit of a demo, demo slash training on, on its use cases and really what it can do and hopefully give everybody a good idea of its capabilities. So um, with that, let me jump a little into this thing and um, and I'll cover, cover Fusion 360. Um, so the first thing uh, of all is, you know, why did Autodesk make Fusion 360? Um, you know, it, it's to address various needs that we saw in kind of in manufacturing and production right now. So we're kind of at this new cusp of, of a next industrial revolution where production is changing. So things like additive manufacturing are becoming mainstream. And really, if you think about that, that means the way we've built things in the past is now completely different. Before, we kind of designed based on what could be manufactured using subtractive manufacturing. That's not the case anymore. Now we can design almost anything that you can think of can be made with additive manufacturing. Uh, demand is changing. Customers nowadays want something specific to them. And that sort of ties into additive manufacturing where you can't just have an assembly line pumping out the same thing anymore. You need to be able to have agile production that meets the demands of individual customers. Uh, companies that are doing that nowadays are making a killing because they're selling what people want, specific things to them. And then products themselves are changing too. Things are becoming smart. Almost everything is connected in some way. You know, dishwashers are now, uh, washing machines, refrigerators, and that's becoming a market expectation by consumers. So companies need to start meeting that. So because of all these changes that are happening, we can't design things the way we used to design them anymore. We have to have new methods and techniques for designing. So that's why Autodesk created Fusion 360. If you kind of think about current on-premise CAD solutions, uh, you know, regardless of, of who they are, they all kind of work the same, and they have some limitations. Uh, uh, among them, collaboration is a big one because you're dealing with large files, a lot of parent-child relationships um, that have to be maintained and kept. And with sort of today's day and age, people are often working remotely. In fact, uh, Nigel, Rich, and I are all working from a separate location right now. And that's just kind of how teams are. So collaboration is becoming a really big part of this um, in this day and age. 
And then another big one that, that Autodesk really wanted to address with Fusion 360 is the use of separate tools for design engineering and production. So a really common thing is, you know, for industrial design we see uh, something like Rhino, and then maybe for engineering we see Inventor, and then maybe for production we see Mastercam or something like that. And those are all three different products, uh, <laughs> and that's very disjointed, um, and, and, but it's how people are doing things today. And then also, um, limited flexibilities are tied usually to a specific computer, and it's usually, up until today, um, a, a PC workstation. Um, and so Autodesk was really trying to change a lot of that. You know, that there's there's various problems that come with that, and, and limitations to sort of achieving these these next generation type products. So, uh, you know, when Autodesk was looking to to make a new product to kind of address the future changes and the and the way things are are you know the the way the the industry is going. We looked to a lot of engineers and designers and said, you know, if you could design a CAD program in this day and age, what would it do? And uh, you know, a lot of people gave a lot of a lot of different thoughts. Um, it really, you know, if you kind of think about how, you know, how how ideas are sourced now, we crowdsource. So that's what Autodesk did. They they decided, you know, let's not make the tool we think people want. Let's ask them what they want in a tool and and make the tool based on what they said. You know, the overwhelming. You can see a lot of these different things that people have said, but the overwhelming one was reduce design tool overhead. And and to me, as a designer and engineer. What that means to me is I want the tool to get out of my way. I want to model and design and engineer the way I think I should, and I want let, to let the tool accommodate me rather than me needing to know the, the minutia and idiosyncrasies of the tool. I just want to be able to design how I design. I want the tool to accommodate my workflow. Um, <clears throat> so what are the three major tenets of Fusion 360s? Number one, it's integrated. So that's taking that industrial design, that engineering, that CAE, that machining, all of those separate disjointed tools, let's put them in one tool and one workflow. So you're not having to export models, import models, and all of that. Let's make it connected. Uh, like I said, we're all in different locations, but we want to be able to work as if we were in the same office or in the same room. So let's use, use the cloud to connect us all, regardless of where we are, and let's make it accessible. Instead of tying it to a specific computer, let's tie it to a user's account. So if you think about your email, whether I'm on my iPad, whether I'm on a library computer, whether I'm on my home computer, or, you know, or if I travel to another office, whenever I log into my email, it's all there. It's tied to me as a person, and it's, it's because the files live in the cloud, I have access to it anywhere. And that's the same thing with Fusion 360. Um, you can access it wherever, and the license is tied to you, so you can install it on 50, 50 different machines and log in on any one of them, and your data is always there. Um, so if you kind of think about Fusion in and of itself, it really is its own CAD platform. It's not just one thing like function or not just one thing like form. Um, but it does everything. Like I said earlier, you can do your industrial design, your engineering work, so you know assemblies, motion, stress analyses, which I'll, I'll be covering quite a bit in this um, in this session later. And then also managing your data. That's another big thing: is is how you manage parent-child relationships, version control. It's all handled by Fusion in the background automatically. So it does everything. And that's really the whole point of Fusion is to address the next, kind of the next generation's engineering problems. So I don't want to spend a ton of time in the PowerPoint. Let's get right to it and, um, and we'll talk, you know, I'll, I'm not going to talk, I'm just going to show Fusion and give you a nice overview of what it does, how it works, and, and everything like that. So um, we'll jump right in. Uh, uh, I know I don't have a ton of time, and I could go on for hours about this kind of stuff. So um, this is Fusion 360. Anybody who's used a, a, a CAD program, I, I take it probably almost everybody out there is an Inventor user, but uh, I know we've got some AutoCAD users as well. Um, this should be pretty darn familiar. You know, it's a 3D uh, CAD program. Here's what's so unique about Fusion, though. I talked about a lot of other things. It does CAM, it does simulation, it does all these things. But even in the modeling, there's a very distinct difference that I want to point out right away. Is um, when you think about 3D modeling, uh, there's really three major types and schools of thought. 
there's parametric modeling. So Inventor, um, SolidWorks, Creo are parametric modelers, meaning all the features and, and geometry is stored in a parameter relating to each other. And that's awesome for engineering because it means if you make a change, your changes propagate down the line. So you can make one change early on and affect all this downstream work and not have to redo everything. That's perfect. But then there's also things like direct editors, so Siemens and X, where you don't have a history base. You can just push and pull faces, and that's really nice because if you have a very long feature tree, a lot of, of parent-child relationships, and you don't want to break something by deleting a face that it was referencing, with a direct editor, you don't need to worry about that because everything kind of exists on its own, and you can push and pull faces without affecting downstream features. That's really nice in its own use cases. And then we also have subdivisional modelers. So these are where you get your industrial designers where you make very complex surfaces that can be very sculpted, very ergonomic, but doing them very quickly. And so those are all kind of three different modeling programs. Things like, like Rhino or Maya or parts of Alias can do all those. So up until now, those have all been very disjointed tools. Here's what's so cool about Fusion. It does every single one of those modeling techniques. It does parametrics, it does subdivisional modeling, and it does direct editing in one workflow. You're not, you're not changing from computer to computer or program to program. You're doing it all in the same workflow. So let me jump in. I'm going to show you a little bit about how all those work together. I'll talk about some simulation and, and all kinds of great things. So um, what I've got here is a reciprocating saw. And you can kind of see it's, it's both a lot of mechanical engineering, but it's also a lot of... Um, industrial design and ergonomic work, very sculpted surfaces, and this is something that would be, it's not impossible to do parametrically. I used to teach surfacing classes. You can do this, but it's not nearly as easy to do as you if you use a proper tool like a subdivisional modeler to create that. So I'll give you a little preview uh, of how that would be done in a sub in a sub D environment. So <clears throat> let's say I, I wanted to um, to to create this shell form here. And I've got a, you know, a, a conceptual sketch that maybe we created in, in like sketchbook or something like that. And I want to model this form, you know, basically from scratch. Honestly, I want to save a tiny bit of time, so I've, I've pre-set up a couple, a couple shapes here. Um, but the big takeaway with, with subdivisional modeling <clears throat> is that it's very push-pull. So how this works is an inventor has some of this. So obviously this is going to be a, a recap for some people who, who have explored this in Inventor. But Fusion has, has, a, has a lot more robust tools with this. So I'm going to show you some really neat things of, of why this is so relevant. So with T-Splines, which is the, the, the engine that powers Fusion's subdivisional modeling, um, it does some really cool things. So number one is I can take an edge, a vertice, a face, and I can really tweak it however I want. So you can kind of see doing something like this parametrically would be super cumbersome, really difficult. I can really tweak a lot of things and just to get just the right, um, kind of the right form here. But what's also really cool is this is always going to maintain curvature continuity and if the ends are capped, always watertight. So here's where it really differs from doing like a, um, a parametric surfacing where you're doing like overbuilding, trimming of surfaces, repairing edges, knitting, knitting um, edges together, and then hoping it's all watertight. This thing is always going to be watertight, always curvature continuous. I can add creases and break that, but um, by default, you know, it maintains it really well, which allows me to make pretty complex shapes super easily. And here's what's really cool. So let's say you kind of saw I'm able to kind of come in and pull any of these faces whichever direction I want. Maybe bring this one out uh, and you kind of get the idea. Um, but let's say I want to start linking this handle, uh, this handle to the kind of the bottom piece here. So in addition to pushing and pulling faces, I can also grow faces. So maybe just grow a couple faces off on the bottom. Now I need to link these two together and here's what's kind of cool. Um, I mentioned T-Splines is the name of, of the engine that powers this. And here's what's so unique versus other subdivisional modelers. In a typical sense, if I wanted to subdivide a surface like this, because I've got two surfaces I'm trying to blend into one, in a typical subdivisional tool like you see in, in most other um, industrial design programs, what you have to do is if you want to divide something, you have to globally um, globally subdivide it. And I'm going to show you why this differs here. Let me say I want to insert an edge. And I'm able to insert an edge 
on just one face. In a normal tool, I'd have to divide up this face and this face, and we'd have to globally um, refine it all over. Because T-splines allows for these T-points, and that's the mathematics that goes behind terminating an edge mid-face, which, by the way, is, is super complex in the background, we're able to get really local refinement. So if you ever do any surfacing or spline modeling, you know that it's a really big trade-off between how much detail you can have. You know, the more control points you have, the more detail. But then it's also harder to maintain really smooth spans. This gives you the best of both worlds. I can pretty much just merge or locally refine in areas where I want additional um, additional detail, but not over refine the rest of the model, adding unnecessary complexity. Autodesk is the only company that has this technology. It's 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 patented by Autodesk. It's in Fusion as well as um, in Inventor. So keep that in mind. It allows you these really complex forms super super easily. So now if I want to come in here and say, you know, I'll bridge these two together. Now I've got a really nice smooth span. And if you kind of think about doing this parametrically, that would have been pretty complex. I would have had to do all this kind of merging of edges, overbuilding, trimming, and all of this. But with, you know, with Fusion and with the T-splines environment, maybe I'll grow a couple more faces down here. I'm able to get something pretty complex, always curvature continuous, and I can just keep tweaking, pushing, and pulling this to get the exact form I want in, in pretty much no time at all. So, you know, imagine if I just want to continually go, go through this, we'll keep growing some new faces up here, maybe grow another one here, rotate these faces, kind of just get this form just right, maybe tweak this back edge a little more. You kind of get the idea. It's, it's a lot of just pushing and pulling to to achieve my industrial design, and I can build this out. Um, obviously, then mirror it, stitch it, uh, not even have to stitch it together, but just mirror it and, and keep going from there. So that's a little bit of a preview. Um, to kind of complete this form, it takes probably about 30 minutes, so I'm not going to spend the whole time on it. I'm just going to give you a nice little idea of how that works. And um, But if I, if I access kind of this other one that was done earlier, that's basically the whole way this entire shell was made, is just taking what I had done, but kind of completing it, adding more faces, growing them, and getting the form just right. So this thing can be done in, say, we'll call 30 minutes probably, is, is a pretty good estimate for, for somebody who's, who knows what they're doing in, in T-splines. Doing this in a parametric modeling sense would probably take a day or two to get everything just right. And then imagine if you had to make an edit. You can't just push and pull a face if somebody says, let's make that wider. You have all these sketches and underlying geometry to fix and hope it doesn't break. So that's really hopefully gives you an idea of the power of, of a subdivisional modeler, especially when you're trying to get some forms just right. It's just so simple. And because we have a full timeline history here, if I make any changes to that initial form, all my parametric work following that will update. So here's what's really cool. We're combining parametric sub-D and direct editing with a timeline. So you can do different operations based on what fits the, what fits things best. So, you know, earlier we did um, some parametric or um, some subdivisional work to start this to get the form just right. Stacked on a bunch of parametrics. Let me show a little bit more about some of the parametrics in, in Fusion 360. This isn't going to be too drastically different from Inventor. You know, parametrics is parametrics. Um, <clears throat> but just to kind of give a little bit of idea of, of, of some of its capabilities. So um, let's say I've got a vent sketch here. Let's just do a little, a little cuts and things like that just to give an idea of, of, of this. So, you know, I have a vent sketch I created using, you know, standard sketch tools. And you know, select my 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 sketches for for my cut. And in Fusion, we've got the press pull tool, which is basically a catch-all tool that that depending on whether I'm I'm cutting through geometry, it's either a, um, you know an extrusion, or if I go through geometry, it can switch to a cut kind of on the fly. But there's also some really unique capabilities within Fusion that um that I'll talk about is. When you're modeling in Fusion, there's really no concept of assembly and part modeling anymore. I, I'm just modeling. At a later point, I can turn things into as assemblies, or I can turn them into subparts or new parts. But as I'm modeling, 
I'm just modeling. So kind of everything starts at the top level. And what's so cool is when I turn something into a part, the sketches and features that underlie that part will automatically be transfer transferred over to the part level. Um, so it's, it's kind of this really unique, unique blend where the tool gets out of my way, as I said earlier. I'm just modeling and I don't have to worry about the assembly structure beforehand because maybe I don't know what some, where something's going to go. And then at a later point I can say, you know what, this is going to be its own part. All the features and sketches that were used to create that body will be transferred over to the part level rather than still residing at the assembly level. So really cool how they've rethought that. So let me do another thing here. We'll, um, we'll, we'll do a couple, um, a couple ribs here. Ribs here, so I want to show this. I think this is a pretty, pretty unique, uh, pretty cool capability. So, let's say I don't know where something is. Uh, Fusion's got its own little, little toolbox that's contextually aware. Um, I can also do searches in it. So, let's say I want to search for a web. There it is, right there. Select my sketches here, and maybe this will be like a two millimeter web. Looking pretty good, and then maybe just do another parametric feature on top of that. Start a sketch um, on this face. Maybe grab my rectangle tool, just like Inventor or other other um, you know other major tools. I have the ability to um, to use mouse gestures and things like that to activate to access these tools a little quicker. I know I say this is like 10 by 28 and seven millimeters from this top section here. And this is going to then be a cutout. So once again, that same press pull tool um, you can either be adding geometry or cutting through geometry. And because we're using parametrics, why don't we use an end condition um, to go up to say like this face? So you know, it, it, the whole point I'm trying to illustrate here is obviously none of these are super, uh, <laughs> super uh, crazy tools like an extrude or a cut. But the the point is that I'm stacking parametric features on top of a freeform feature where they're referencing the freeform geometry. So if that changes, these will all change too. Um, you know, so then maybe I'll do like a rules based fillet on this too. We want to say fillet um, that extrude and then the web with something like um, a one, one millimeter fillet. One might be a little bit big, let's say 0.5. There we go, 0.5 is a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> so I've got, my, I've got my fillet in here, and here's the last thing I want to show, at least with, uh, with this, is I want to add some draft to this. So that's normally a pretty straightforward operation. And so let's say I'd like to draft, um, you know, obviously this is injection, injected molded. I need a little bit of draft on this. So let's draft uh, these two faces here. And something, something slight, we'll just do like uh, two degrees maybe. Here's what I really want to point out with this though, and this is what's really cool, is I'm drafting after a fillet, which is normally very difficult for a parametric tool to accomplish, because typically when it drafts a face out, you consume a fillet like this, a tiny little fillet, and then it causes all kinds of problems. Typically what you need to do is you need to fill it after, you know, as one of your last features is typically a, a smart modeling practice is to fill it last, just to prevent this. Fusion doesn't have a problem, and because in at its core, its kernel is a direct editing kernel, so it's able to move these faces and reestablish and repair the fill. That's what a direct editor can do very well. It's very good at geometry reconstruction, and even though I'm doing parametric features, the direct editing kernel that underlays this is able to do these geometry repairs and fix that. So really, this kind of ties back into what I was saying earlier. The tool gets out of my way. I don't have to know that a fillet should always come after a draft. The software is able to still accomplish this regardless of what I do. Even if I'm not using the best modeling practices in a typical parametric tool, it's fine. It's fine in Fusion. I can do this. So kind of one last direct editing tool before we jump on forward is, um, oh, I'm going really long on time. So hopefully everybody's going to bear with me a little bit more. So just do one last tool. And this is a, this is a really cool one. I really, really want to show this. So if I want to do like an overmold on this very complex face here, um, Check this out. This is really cool. So let's split these faces using the sketch I have here. And I want to do an overmold. So in a typical parametric sense, we'd have to do like thickens and you know um, merge or, or, or combines and all this stuff. 
I just grab that same press pull tool that I use for extrusions, cuts, all of that. I select all these faces and let's say we want to offset this uh, 1.5 millimeters. And even though this face has a lot of complex curvature, it's concave, convex, it has holes in it, because Fusion can do direct editing, I'm able to offset this face, this super complex face with, you know, basically no problems at all and it's still a solid. Like, so now I have my overmold, grab that same press pull tool as before, and maybe we'll do like a uh, one millimeter fillet on this. Once again, not a problem. Everything's repaired, reestablished. So this should give you some of the, cap the ideas of the capabilities of Fusion in terms of modeling where I'm stacking all of this parametrically with a timeline on top of freeform modeling and then kind of mix in a little bit of direct editing features while I was at it. So let me talk a little bit about um, some assembly design and uh, then we'll get into simulation. So this is this is pretty cool from assembly perspective. Maybe I won't do the whole thing uh, in terms of time constraints, but let's um, let's show some of this. I like this stuff. I think it's really really neat. So in um, in Fusion, if I want to um, connect all these together, joints are super simple within Fusion. Um, Depending on what, what tool you come from, you may be familiar with some of this operation, so, so bear with me if you are, but for, for those of you who aren't, I really want to show this, how, how cool this is. So um, with Fusion, I can do either joints or as-built joints. As-built meaning things are already in the correct location. So I can come in and say, you know what, I want to do a revolute um, joint between this gear um, and this, this pin, and this is the axis of revolution. Gives me a really nice um, animation preview. I'm not sure if that comes through on the GoToMeeting. Typically, it doesn't. Uh, let's do the same thing. So, create it between this linkage, its pin, choose its revolute axis of revolution. So, I'm basically doing everything with just one click. Rather than removing degrees of freedom, <clears throat> or rather than adding degrees, adding constrained degrees of freedom like I would in, in most parametric tools, I'm starting with all my degrees of freedom locked and releasing just one degree of freedom, in this case, a rotation. And that's what really speeds up my workflow is I'm able to, to with most things, only use one operation to achieve my... Um, to achieve kind of my desired mechanical movement instead of multiple operations by saying, hey, you know, I don't want this face to move up and down, I don't want it to move left and right, and I want to lock down a couple rotations. One of these will, will accomplish everything. So one last, um, one last operation, this one's going to be a slider, so I'll say, you know what, this um, reciprocating saw component is going to slide within this housing, and this is the axis. And that's all there is to it. You know, I'm not worried about, um, you know, saying these two are parallel and doing distance and all this stuff. Now I have all my motion constrained. And that looks perfect with just, what was that, four joints is all it took in, in pretty much no time at all. So really cool, really, really nice capabilities for um, connecting all these. But here's my favorite thing. This is my favorite thing in all of Fusion. I really want to make sure I show this before I get to the, um, the simulation aspect. A lot of tools, um, programs, have, have built-in toolboxes, parts libraries, component libraries, whatever you're going to call them. Um, Fusion does the same. Here's what's unique about Fusion, though. Uh, I kind of touch on this. Fusion is a cloud-enabled program. We, do, we use the cloud for certain things. But it also enables a lot of really cool capabilities. So rather than having a static toolbox that comes with every service pack that we update, and maybe then it gets changed, we kind of have a live toolbox. So back when I was an engineer, if I wanted to insert a component, um, I would, you know, I would use a toolbox. I'd find the, the right size uh, fastener. I'd put it in my model, and then after we get to production, then I have to resource that that fastener. You know, who makes it? How much do they cost? You know, find something that's that's more or less it real a real version of that idealized toolbox component. Well, here's what's cool about Fusion: our toolbox library is McMaster Car's library. So right from within Fusion, I can browse McMaster Car, and here's there's a couple of really great things. Number one, it's a huge library, first of all, and um, then I'm also guaranteed real components that that exist. I can check the prices. I can check to see if if you know if it adds actually there because I, I used to work in aerospace, so sometimes we'd source or design for a component that had like a two month lead time, you know, and you don't want that. You want to be able to find something immediately. So I want a panhead machine screw. Um, this thing's going to be a metric. 
this thing's going to be M5, and I want something, let's say, 10 millimeters long. So I'm browsing the MasterCard's real-time library because we're cloud, you know, we're cloud enabled. We're going to a website, super simple integration, and always up to date. I can see for these uh, 316 stainless, it's 1036. Uh, I can find more product details, but here's the best part. You know, we have drawings and everything. I'll download this. But I'm not just downloading it to my computer. Remember, we're terminaling into this from Fusion. It's downloading the file, converting it. To, uh, to a Fusion Files part, and you know what? <clears throat> Look at this. Check out this right now. We are cloud-enabled, so Rich Sanchez, one of the panelists right now, he just made a comment. He said, Jeff, can we see this with a different finish? Finish, And he's attached a screenshot. Let's check that out when we get to, um, when we get to our comments. But this is what's so cool. Remember, I said we're all in a completely different location right now. Um, we can completely collaborate. So look at Rich has included a screenshot too. I can see what he wants to do. Okay, he wants to see this with a different finish. Maybe we'll maybe we'll explore some other designs. Um, I can comment right back from within Fusion and say, "Sure thing, Rich." Um, let's try a different texture. I don't know. So it's almost like we're working in the same. You know, in the same room, he's seen the same model I'm working on, even though we're in completely different locations. So this really brings a ton of collaboration capability because I can make a change and save it. And he can, you know, the, the, the minute it's saved, he can see my updates and verify if he likes my design changes or not. That's how quick that is. So, you know, I brought this screw in. And I think that's a great idea, Rich. We'll go ahead and change that uh, in a minute. So I brought this screw in. Uh, some great things is it's exactly what I buy from McMaster Car. If we look at my assembly tree structure, I even have the McMaster Car part number. So now, you know, if we need to make an order, we know exactly what to buy from McMaster Car. I'll go ahead and, and connect this up to where it's supposed to go. It, you know, with a preview, and this is what's so great about the preview, it looks like I'm in a slider joint still. Let's go ahead and just make this rigid. Now I've locked that down. Now we are screw in there. Um, and everything looks good. So that's, you know, that's what's so cool. I love that. Now, um, let's go ahead and save this. Uh, hey, Jeff, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, it looks like some people lost audio, including me, um, for the last, it looked like it was global for the last uh, little bit there, but it looks like we have it all back now. Um, we lost audio for maybe 15 seconds. Sorry, everybody. Um, to care of that already, though. So uh, we can keep going, just making sure that everyone can hear. Yeah, perfect. Jim, perfect. So I think all I was talking about was adding a texture um, uh, per, per Rich's request. And so I'll, I'll, I'll save this thing and, you know, give it a nice little, a little description for this. Um, and here's what's really cool about, about Fusion. So as I save this, um, because Fusion is a modern program, the model is still saving. It's still being pushed to the cloud, as evidenced by my, my data panel in the circle. But I'm still free to keep working. Because we're modern, um, all of the saves and a lot of, of non-essential modeling is pushed off to different threads. You know, I'm, uh, I'm in a multi-threaded computer. Um, if you think about when most typical parametric CAD programs were made, that was back when everything was seen. You know, you just had one core at the time. They were developed in the early to mid-90s. But nowadays, that's not the same. We all have multi-threaded, multi-core computers. So a lot of things that can be done on Fusion can be pushed off to other cores. Um, another thing I want to talk about really briefly, I'm not going to render anything out, is just our rendering environment. So we have built in a full ray tracer where I can change scene settings. I can, I can um, change textures from here. I can change depth of field. I can render this thing out. Um, but what's really neat is because we're cloud enabled, I can either render it locally, like everybody would be used to with the rendering, but I can also render it on the cloud and let the cloud do the rendering so I'm not taking up any of my resources. Because rendering is a super computationally intensive task, a rendering can vary, you know, depending on what quality you need, it can vary from 10 minutes to hours, depending on the complexity of the scene, where it can be done typically par in parallel on the cloud for just 10 minutes. So it gives you the options to do a lot of cool things utilizing the cloud for what the cloud does best. Data management, data backup, and computationally intensive tasks. 
So um, I, I know I'm going a little bit over. I'm, I'm going to almost get to the end here. Let's talk a little simulation here. So Fusion can do modeling. It can do rendering. It can do animations. Um, we're not going to talk about CAM today, but we can do uh, we can do CAM machine toolpaths. So that's be something fun to cover another time. But I do want to talk about simulation. So within Fusion, we also have the ability to do stress simulation. Um, I set up a few of these to kind of to kind of go through this quickly. But let let me just set up one to give everybody an idea of how this will work. So. Fusion's got multiple study types built into it. We can do stress, static stress, modal frequencies, thermal, and thermal stress. So statics is, you know, if you have some, some weight or load on something, how does it deflect? What are the stresses? Uh, modal frequencies is vibration analysis. Thermal, how does the thermal distribution uh, propagate throughout my model? And then thermal stress is, you know, if we have... Uh, something fixed, and they might have different uh, thermal expansion coefficients. One expands more than the other. It's going to induce stresses, and we want to know what that is. So let me set up a couple, uh, one or two of these, and I'll just show some completed results from the other one. So if I want to set up a static stress here, um, pretty simple. We can do this at the whole assembly level. Let's say, you know, we don't want to analyze the whole thing for the sake of time. Like I said, um, yeah, certain things are computation computationally intensive. Simulation is certainly one of them. So I'll reduce this model down and let's say we want to um, only look at this gear housing and let's maybe a couple more things the blade guard and this blade guard assembly those are what we want to what we want to analyze for so fusion makes it super simple you do everything kind of in a left to right structure um, materials have already been applied at the model level so I don't need to change the materials maybe we'll do some constraints here uh, I'll just fix these two holes that's where the, this would be mounted. In reality, they're probably more of a pin, which I can change that to. Um, but you know, for the sake of time, we'll just we'll leave it as, as fixed and say that's going to be close enough. Um, this is an assembly, so I also need to establish contact, uh, which I can do within Fusion. It also allows me to do automatic contact. So I'll just say yes and have everything be bonded. I can always change this later, but in reality, this would probably be bonded to begin with. So it's going to automatically bond all of the separate components together which is good enough for the sake of this analysis. Um, <clears throat> and then I need a load to this. Notice I know I haven't completed this because I have this little red, you know, kind of stop sign thing. It's still showing me red. I'm missing something. I've forgotten to put a load on this. So let's say, you know, maybe somebody's blade gets stuck. We don't have the blade in here, but, you know, maybe the blade guard hits something. And we'll do like a 75-pound force. Now I'm seeing green. I must have everything done. I have my my um, my materials. I have my constraints. I have my my contact set set up. Last thing I might want to do is um, is change my mesh. You know, this is something you, don't, you certainly don't need to do necessarily. But if you if you're a little more into simulation and you want to tweak some things, I can go ahead and, and modify you know element size, things like that, um, um, doing curvature based elements. Um, and you know, let's go ahead and see what see what we get with this. We'll solve this one real time. I, I don't think this one takes too long to mesh and solve, um, but you know, over time it's going to take a little while. And this is one of the other things that currently we, we have to do it locally, but in a very soon update we'll be able to do cloud-based um, simulation solves too. So if I did want to analyze that entire model of the reciprocating saw, that would take forever on my computer, honestly, to mesh all of that. And, and solve that. Uh, but using the cloud, once again, I can use parallel computing, more or less infinite computing power, and get those results back super quickly. So one of the other many benefits of having a cloud-based um, you know, infrastructure and a cloud-based, uh, cloud-enabled computer, I'm able to take advantage of these things. So I'll give this kind of another second to solve. Um, and then I'll go ahead and show some of the results uh, of, the, of the other studies that I've kind of pre-built. So right now, I can see, um, you know, my stress distribution, or rather, I'm sorry, this is the safety factor. Let's say per this, um, per this design, I want to always carry a safety factor greater of three. So, you know, while I can look at stresses, displacement, strain, thing like that, let's leave it on safety factor. And let's say I only want to see things that are three and less. So, yeah, we'll just change this uh, chart and look at everything less than three. So. If this is my goal to have everything above safety factor of three, these are the elements in the areas that are failing. So it looks like probably something in this connection would need to be revised. So 
you know, this gives me a very quick sanity check. Granted, it's not the, the, the most robust simulation tool in the entire world. Autodesk has some very in-depth analysis programs, but this gives me a wonderful cursory look just to know if I'm even going the right direction with my, my design. I didn't have to send this off to an anal analyst, an analyst <laughs> um, to, to, be, to be looked at when I could have just done this locally and I know maybe I can increase this fillet size or bring this face back a little bit more and make this connection a little more robust. Um, so, it, you know, certainly it gives me a long way and it gives me a good idea of what, you know, what I'm looking at with my, cap with, um, with my design. So in addition to to um, uh, stress analysis, I can also do modal frequency analysis. So this is, you know, this remember this motor is is pushing a blade back and forth at about um, I think I looked them up. It's about 3,000 RPM, which equates to about 50 hertz. I want to make sure this structure is ro is ro stiff enough that it's not going to also vibrate at 50 hertz because if, if this gets excited at that same 50 hertz or anything lower that this blade mm -hmm. might be operating at this whole thing could start shaking quite a bit, and we don't want that. Um, so that's a perfect use for a, a modal analysis to see what, where this thing is excited at. And it looks like we're only excited at everything above 444 hertz. So we're well stiff enough that we don't have to worry about the motor and the blade exciting this structure and having it start shaking. Um, so I was able to analyze with that uh, as well. But that's not all. You know, I can come in here and I've done a thermal analysis. So I, pr I assumed that, that this blade, as it moves in and out, produces quite a bit of friction on these blade guides and, and gets up to 50 degrees Celsius. This is all just guesses on my part and estimations. Um, but I'm able to see the thermal distribution. So it looks like this part does get pretty hot, the blade guide, but then it cools down um, using natural convection is, is what I'm assuming on this. And I can see where things are getting hot. So maybe if we have plastic pieces near this, we might need an isolator of some sort, a thermal isolator, to prevent our plastic from melting. And this gives me a wonderful idea for knowing these things. But even better, I can also check my thermal stresses. So why is this important? Well, remember I said, you know, as this is mounted rigidly, as it heats up, it's going to expand, which is going to be a displacement. And if it's held by something else, or if we have two different types of metals, this big blade, um, uh, this big assembly is cast iron, but this top cap is aluminum. They're going to expand at different rates. And as one expands faster than the other, it's going to add stresses. So I can now look at stresses that are induced by that thermal, um, thermal expansion. So it looks like overall, it's not bad. We just have some some major stresses down at where these are fixed, but typically when you see something down near a fixture, you might want to look at how you've actually constrained it. I think I just fixed these, which is obviously not really correct. The plastic would be expanding where this is mounted. There would be some kind of rotations allowed, maybe even a bushing that isolates this. So this was a very idealized situation, but like I said, it gives me a great idea for just making sure my design passes kind of that first sanity check, you know, are, are, are our stresses too high and should we look at a redesign right away. So Fusion's doing all of these, you know, and, and keep in mind because we're in the same environment, if I wanted to come back and make any kind of change to this, you know, I, I need to make, make a modification, hey, you know what, not a problem. Those will all propagate through. I can just rerun my analyses with the updated models. I don't have to set up anything again. All those setups have been maintained. So, you know, I, I'll cover it a ton of stuff, but there's one last thing I really want to talk about is where my data is being stored. This is about the last thing. I know I'm going super, super long. I, I appreciate everybody who's, who's hanging on. I actually see a lot of you are, are still on, and that's wonderful. Um, so in addition to all that, that's only half of the equation. Fusion, Fusion is more revolutionary, not because of its modeling, but because of what I'm going to show right now. It's where the data is stored and how it's managed. So if I come to my data panel, I can see all the parts in this project, but I, I can also see, so here's this reciprocating saw. I can see all the children associated and parents. There's a mold core um, that we've already created. Here's what's so neat. Let's open the details in A360. So if I open uh, the, the, the file here, uh, in fact, let me, I've updated it. Let me refresh this one. I think we're on version 8 now, if I recall. 
version 9 apparently. So here is my data management and keep in mind I am no longer in Fusion. I am in a web browser, only a web browser. Everything for, from here on out can be accomplished in a web browser. That means a computer, uh, it means a tablet, a smartphone, anything with a web browser. So I can see all the, all the ch children of this assembly. I can see the parents of this assembly. We have a mold core and notice it even says it's out of date. That's because I have not yet updated the mold core with the chain geometry that I've been fiddling with here. If we have drawings, I can see associated with drawings. I can see all my associated simulation data and any renderings, which, um, which are also out of date. I just need to, I have created new renderings of this version. Uh, so everything right here, but even better, I can see the full comment history. So, you know, this is where I said that I was going to start with some new industrial design. Rich wanted to see some different finishes. I said, let's try something different. This is great because rather than exchanging emails, which are kind of disjointed from your design process, this stuff is embedded at the project level. It's even version specific. So I know Ver Rich was commenting on version 7. So I know that in version 8, I've since corrected, or version 9, I've since corrected what he asked for. So I'm not, I don't have to go back and say, oh, when did he send an email asking for this? I have all this information right here. Here's what's even cooler. I can go ahead and view this model in 3D, all with a web browser, zero install is necessary. Just anybody in my project. At this point, it's free now, too, you know. Um, th there's no Fusion license even yet necessary for this, just access to my project, um, which is just permission-based. So there's the model in 3D. I can see simulation results here. I can explode the model. I can even do a markup and say um, something like, looks good. And this will once again be saved as a comment at this project level. The best part is though, this is all for things for people that are in my project, in my company. What if I want to share this with a third party, a client, a manufacturer, and I don't want to give them access to all this data? I can generate a third party share link. This is a simplified view um, that maybe doesn't have download capability. Of course, I can turn it on or off at will. It maybe doesn't have, or it doesn't have um, all the comment history, all the version history, because I want to retain that intellectual property. I don't want to share this out. It's just the model view, so I can send this to a customer. All they need is a link. They don't have to download a viewer at all to do any of this. They don't even need a login if I don't specify it. And they can view this. In fact, you know what, I'm going to send this link out to the entire audience so you guys can check this out in a web browser. And this is the model I've been working on the whole time. What's cool too is if I make a change, this link, it's a live link to this one model that exists on the cloud, you'll instantly see those updates once you, once you refresh. There's no sending out of new links or anything like that. So you can kind of now see how anybody in the world can collaborate on this project. We can all see the same data. There's ever only one version of the data. It exists on the cloud. Any of us can work on it, save it, and see those changes update in real time. And that's really where Fusion gets powerful because, once again, that's only accomplished through the cloud. Modeling can be, you know, modeling is modeling, but this is where the cloud infrastructure really plays a huge role in this. So, um, you know, that's a ton of stuff I covered. I, <laughs> I was trying to, I told the guys, I was like, I'll keep it to 30 minutes, 35 minutes. It looks like that took me 50 minutes to get through that. And I, I was going pretty fast, but I get really excited about this stuff. I'm, I, I really enjoy it. It's, it's super fun and it's really cool, this forward facing stuff. So, um, you know what, let's, let's go ahead and I guess we'll just go into Q&A. I think I covered the majority of what I wanted to, to, to talk about. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, just jump into Q&A, but beforehand, like you mentioned, we do have some AVA information for you. Um, if you could go ahead and open that link that I sent you, Jeff. Um, so next week, uh, we've got a special AVA, which is really cool. Um, so we're going to do our normal AVA at 10 o'clock. Um, it's going to be a 30-minute... Uh, a you know, a 30 to 40 minute usual AVA. I'm going about some uh, some vault properties from to link those properties from uh, your models into vault. Um, but afterwards, we're going to be doing a special um, in-person vault care workshop um, in-house here at Kativ Technologies. So if you are local to Kativ, um, go ahead and um, go to this link. I'll go ahead and link this in the chat right now. And uh, go ahead and sign up. I'm sure some of you received this uh, this invitation already. We're going to go over um, some best practices in regards to maintaining a healthy vault or a happy vault, if you may. Um, and so if that's something you're definitely interested in, um, go ahead and reserve your seat here. Um, we'll be, you know, 
serving breakfast and uh, having some fun. But yeah, you can get to meet the, the AVA team, see how we get everything done here. There's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes here. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, go ahead and uh, follow that link, and we'll be able to go through there. But uh, for now, we do have a couple of questions here, Jeff and, uh, and Rich. Um, we've answered a couple of them uh, during the presentation, and but some of them we feel as if uh, would benefit from or everyone would benefit from uh, the answer from. So first off, um, the, the big question is like, how do I get Fusion 360? I already have Inventor. Um, I might already have Product Design Suite. Jeff, um, I'm sure you get that question every once in a while. I know the answer, but I think it'll be a little easier from, from Jeff. Yeah, um, so depending, so Fusion comes can come to you in a couple ways. If you are on um, Product Design Suite um, profe Professional or Ultimate, you and on subscription, you have access to Fusion. You have access to as many licenses of Fusion as um, product design suites on subscription. So anybody who's, who has that, go ahead and use it right now. It's part of your subscription entitlement. For those of you that don't, Fusion is a separately purchased product. It has a one month free trial, so go ahead and, and sign up for that. And then after that, it's $300 a year per license, so roughly $25 a month. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if you are a hobbyist, or a hobbyist being defined as somebody who does not use Fusion for revenue generating tasks, say you want to lay out your backyard, or you make uh, little little things and you you make less than a hundred thousand dollars doing that in your business, you're also entitled for Fusion for free. Or if you're a student, like all Autodesk products, you're entitled to it for free. So um, really cool, but there's a lot of different ways to get Fusion. Uh, many of you are probably already on subscription, so that's a really good really good option right there. Um, but otherwise, it, it's a pretty pretty inexpensive program for all it offers. And, and there's only one level of Fusion, so if you get Fusion, it's everything. Um, and hobbyist and student versions are no different. They're the full-on version, too. Full-blown Fusion. Um, so let's see here. Um, we had a question from David. Um, can Fusion 360 design objects using molds, um, such as like forging with melted metals? Um, I don't think it can, um, Jeff. Yeah, so um, I, I think what you're saying is, it, maybe we might need some clarification on this question. So with Fusion, because we can do like parametric combines, and um, you know combines and cuts what, and intersects. What you could do is if you had a mold body, you could do like a combine to get the resultant a cavity body. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have a feeling I'm missing exactly what the question is. If you're actually talking about the simulation of something being injected into the mold or melted in and cast, we can't do any of that kind of simulation, but we can design molds and cavities, and then even design the machining path to machine those out. So that part can. We might need some clarification on, on the specifics of it. So I'm going to lean on probably yes to your answer, but without a, a clarification, I'm not 100% sure if I'm, if I'm answering it right. Definitely. And uh, this question actually came in a couple times, um, or in different forms. Um, do you see people moving from Inventor to Fusion? Is this the future of 3D CAD and modeling? What about manufacturing drawing and exploded views? You know, I, I'm, I'm glad that question was asked. So that, that was something that, that I knew was going to come up. Um, so I don't see everybody going from Inventor to Fusion, to be 100% honest. There is always going to be something that Inventor can do more than Fusion. So Fusion, what I showed, everything it can do is awesome but it can only do maybe a tenth of what Inventor can do. Right now we can't do sheet metal. It's coming, but we can't do it yet. We can't do super large assemblies yet. We can't do any kind of routing or piping or anything at all. I don't even know when that's going to come out. So Fusion has a very niche place right now. It's perfect for, and, and here's honestly who we, who we target when we're, we're trying to talk to customers, you know, when we're looking if they're going to be a good use case for Fusion. Um, com companies that make very sculpted or ergonomic things. So a lot of industrial design companies that do both the industrial design and the engineering, those are really good use cases. When you start talking to big factories or people that make super complex machines, we honestly just don't have the capability yet. We can't do weldments. We can't do um, our drawing package is very limited at the time. So um, really, what kind of what it boils down to is probably. <clears throat> Probably a lot of consumer goods are going to be a very good fit for Fusion, while very large engineering, you know, when you think kind of industrial type engineering applications, um, 
not industrial design, but rather industrial engineering, those are probably going to stay with Inventor. And if you kind of think about it, <clears throat> AutoCAD has still been around well after, you know, Inventor has been out for, what is this now, um, 16, 17, 18, I'm trying to do the math in my, oh no, well long, 20-some like years. Um, and AutoCAD still around, so I don't think Adventure will ever be completely unseated, but Fusion is going to be gaining a lot of capabilities as time goes on. They're putting a lot of effort into that because they're trying to address the next generation engineering problems. So, um, you know, kind of a, a long-winded answer of saying, I don't think Adventure is going, to go, is going to go anywhere, and I don't think Fusion will ever have the full capability of Adventure, but it will have a lot more capabilities as time goes on. In fact, um, maybe I'll talk about the roadmap in a, in a little bit later, kind of as a closing statement and where to find that, because that's a really cool, a really cool aspect. Definitely. Um, let's see here. Uh, Mark Patterson asks, can parts be designed in Fusion? Can parts designed in Fusion tie to Vault for managed drawing versions and things like that? Um, I think all that's still managed in the cloud, um, Jeff. Yeah, that that's um that's a good question too. So you know what? I realized I, I didn't answer the second half of the question. Draw uh, the previous question. I'll come back to this one. The previous question also talked about drawings and exploded view. Fusion can do drawings and exploded views as well. Um, I just didn't touch on them. I didn't have time, but it can do that. Uh, you know, if, if anybody keep in mind, if anybody wants to see more, feel. free free to email, you know, email the guys at Kativa, email me. Um, I don't have my email address up here. Maybe I can post this in the chat in a little bit um, when I have a second. I I'm more than happy to, to do a more in-depth session, too. Uh, you know, I was just trying to keep, keep the time constraints because I know a lot of people probably booked only a small amount of time around this. But, yes, we can do those. So back to this question. Um, Fusion manages everything in the cloud. The cloud is the data management. It does um, version history. You know what? Let me come into that, come back to that, too. Reshow my screen here. Um, so within Fusion, it remembers every version I've made and the comment history. So I can come back and see every change I made here, rather every change I saved. It manages that. It knows how the drawings relate to each version. So if I make a new version, the drawing may still reference an old version. I can either update the drawing or I can leave the drawing referencing the different versions. So, so Fusion has its own data management built in. You don't really need Vault with Fusion 360. There's a couple questions here that I'll take, um, that I'll probably take offline. They're a little bit more in depth with people's particular um, situations. Um, okay. Let's see. And then and um, I, just, I just put my email in the chat as well for everybody. Okay. Yeah. So if you don't have any questions for Jeff, go ahead and let Jeff know, or you can just let one of us know here at Katib. We'll definitely relay that information over. Um, also to note, um, if you do want to see more stuff about Fusion, go ahead and make note of it in the uh, Suggest Future Topics um, section in the, the after webinar survey. Um, if we do hear enough feedback from this in which you want to see more, um, you want to see particular things in Fusion, I know one of the big things in Fusion is CAM. Um, go ahead and let us know, um, and if that's the case, you know, we'll go ahead and see if Jeff's free in a couple of months to do another one here for us. Um, this is a big one um, that I saw. Um, can Fusion 360 files be saved locally? Um, and then what is the workflow between Fusion and Inventor? Ah, uh, yeah, great question. So yes, the, the answer is it can. You can, it's more of really what, what's happening is you're exporting it and downloading the file locally, but it loses all link to anything on the cloud. So keep in mind, when you're using Fusion, your working folder is the cloud infrastructure. And the whole reason is because like I, I touched on earlier, you can access your data from anywhere. I can close my laptop that I'm working on right here. I can walk down to Katie, not walk, I can drive to Katie's office. I can open any one of their computers that has Fusion, log in, and it's just like I never left my computer. My, my settings are there, my files are there, all of that. And that's because of the cloud infrastructure, because I'm looking at my data on the cloud. If it's local, I can't do that. So that's one of the big benefits. That said, you can download, if somebody wants to do an archive or a backup, you can download it locally. Now, the Fusion to Inventor, there's right now not a super strong workflow between the two. You can export as an Inventor 2014 file type from Fusion. So if you did want to do like a freeform model or something in Fusion and then bring it into Inventor for kind of some really in-depth engineering type stuff, you could certainly do that, but it's not going to be a really strong workflow. Um, you're not going to be t getting great any CAD type technology or anything yet. It's, you know, we're, we're, this is roadmap stuff, but right now there's kind of a discon disconnected workflow at the moment. Definitely. Um, I think that's it. Um, there's a couple other questions in there. I know that people have um, 
I'll cover those um, individually with you afterwards, so expect either an email or if I have your phone number, I'll go ahead and give you a call. Um, any last words here? I see you have the roadmap up. So definitely the, the, one of the coolest things that I think about the, the Fusion um, team and how they're going about things is their transparency in regards to the roadmap. Um, they kind of are giving us a look into what they're de currently developing um, and like, you know when we can possibly see set updates. Um, so if you want to go a little bit deeper into that, Jeff, before we, we end this here. Here's what's so cool is you can see what we're planning on adding, when we're planning on adding it, and you know, and the progress progress. The the development team is very open to, you know, like I said in the very beginning, we built this based on feedback from people and we're still doing that. We're making changes based on feedback. So you can find out right now where we stand on things, what's coming. And and what's so unique about Fusion is we're on a two week release cycle. Every two weeks there's an update of minor bug fixes and functionality. Every just two months is a major release. So every two months it's like the equivalent of a yearly release on most rig, most on-premise tools. So it's you know super fast development. So you can really check out you know what's happening, simulation updates, and some of these are amazingly huge updates. Like you know the ability to get Nastran and explicit solvers, that's a big deal. Or things like you know Schmetal entirely new workflows like mesh mesh modeling. You know, these are big updates that are coming in here. So, and you can just look this up, you know, it's, it's completely open. It, it, it's visible to the public. Anybody can check this out and see what we're doing. For sure. Um, thank you again, Jeff. It looks like we lost some um, sound. I know I lost a little bit of it and some people did, um, but uh, we'll see what happened. I think it should be on the recording properly um, and we'll get that up on our YouTube channel shortly. So again, thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Um, if you have any suggestions for future topics, make sure to answer that survey. We do take a lot of that seriously. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week. So uh, thank you again, Jeff, and uh, adios, everybody.